It is impossible to address the role of the SS Leibstandarte Division without descending into some murky corners of history. And surely there is none more murky than the origins of the National Socialist Party of Germany. In the difficult political world of the Weimar Republic, the fierce competition between the various political factions competing for power in the troubled arena of post-war German politics frequently descended into physical violence. Adolf Hitler raised a group of 200 men who were known as the Adolf Hitler Stoßtruppen. These fanatics were brought together by a Nazi thug who was also a trusted friend of Hitler's, named Sepp Dietrich. He and the men of the bodyguard pledged themselves to preserving the life of the man whose name was to be embroidered upon the sleeves of the uniforms they wore so proudly. Over the years to come, the strength of the Leibstandarte would grow to 20,000, and it would see action in the toughest fighting in some of the most bitter campaigns of World War II. By then, the small bodyguard formed to protect Hitler would have metamorphosized into the 1st SS Panzer Division, more familiarly known as the Leibstandarte Division from the German word for a bodyguard. Inspired by the grenadiers of the Napoleonic era and the earlier world of classical Rome, it was intended that the Leibstandarte should become to Adolf Hitler what the Old Guard was to Napoleon, or the Praetorian Guard was to Julius Caesar. In their short lifetime, the Leibstandarte was to see more action than the Praetorian Guard could have imagined possible, and they were to see more fighting than the Old Guard in its 12 years of campaigning with the Emperor. There can be little doubt that Hitler viewed himself as being akin to Julius Caesar or Napoleon. And in the same way that Caesar had his own Praetorian Guard and Napoleon had the Old Guard, Hitler decided that he would have the SS Liebstandarte Adolf Hitler. He was so proud of this body of men that he even named them after himself. He thought of creating something akin to a band of medieval knights, an order of chivalry. And there are buildings, there are tables, there are decorations and so forth in Germany still, or photographs of them at least, which bear witness to this dreaming idea of a sort of quasi-chivalrous order. It's possible too that he was thinking of the Teutonic Knights of the 13th century who conquered and colonized in Prussia. Hitler summed up the reason for the creation of this elite formation in a typically rambling speech which he made in 1940. In 1923, I took the decision to create the Adolf Hitler shock troops. It was to be composed entirely of men who were ready for a revolution and who knew that someday things would come to hard knocks. Even Adolf Hitler could surely not have envisaged the real nature of the hard knocks which the Leibstandarte would receive in Russia and France.
From the outset, the Leibstandarte was composed entirely of volunteers. The selection criteria was set very high, and only the fittest and most politically committed recruits were permitted into the ranks of what was already regarded as one of the most prestigious formations in Germany. For Hitler, it was very important in the murky political world in which he operated to have clear-cut support from the people who were around him. He never felt secure in his political power, and for that reason he wanted the men of the Liebstandarte to be the most committed and the most fanatical uh, national and socialists around. It wasn't enough to have uh, people who had simply sworn an oath to Hitler, they had to be dedicated Nazis, and that's what he found. Attracted to join the ranks were a number of outstanding warriors who would leave their mark on the history of the Second World War. Among them were Michael Wittmann, Hans Piper, Max Funch, and Kurt Meyer. But despite their undoubted fighting skill, courage, and even heroism, their reputation was to be sullied by outbursts of brutality and callousness. It was no accident that men such as these were in the ranks of the Leibstandarte. They were loyal to the National Socialist cause and were committed Nazis and they carried the principles of that vicious creed onto the battlefield. After the war, many of these men would find themselves accused of war crimes. During the heady years of peace in the 30s, when the brutal battles of the Russian front still lay a long way in the future, the Leibstandarte was used exclusively for ceremonial purposes. But even in peacetime, as Hitler grew more settled at the head of the German state, under the watchful gaze of Sepp Dietrich, the numbers of the Leibstandarte continued to rise. With ranks swollen by new recruits, they marched proudly at the head of the army when Germany reoccupied the Sudetenland and led the march into Czechoslovakia in early 1939. By this stage, the numbers of men in the ranks had risen to 3,700, and they were now organized into four infantry battalions. Throughout the years in which he held power, Adolf Hitler employed a deliberate policy of creating a labyrinthine bureaucracy which was purposefully designed to create as much duplication and confusion as possible. The resulting tensions between the various branches of the government could then be exploited by Hitler, as he was the only one with an overview of the entire confused situation. Beneath the surface air of calm was a seething mass of disorder, but it worked for Hitler. And this policy of deliberate duplication was extended to the armed forces with the creation of the Waffen-SS. The existence of what was effectively an army within an army was a typical maneuver on the part of Hitler, who mistrusted the officer corps to whom he felt inferior. He was, after all, only a corporal who now rubbed shoulders with the men who had once occupied an impossibly lofty position. He was well aware of the sneers of many of the generals. By developing his own miniature army, composed entirely of party members, Hitler had a measure of protection against a possible coup d'etat. In the person of Arnold Hitler, we see a picture of disturbed paranoia. Hitler constantly duplicated the instruments of government. It led to tremendous confusion and conflict uh, within the ordinary departments of government, 
but he also did this within the army. The SS was a kind of army within an army, and he was constantly setting out to cause as much duplicity and confusion almost as he could, because at the centre of it, he was the only person who had his finger on all of the pulses. Adolf Hitler believed in struggle, that the strongest man, the strongest beast, would emerge from a natural process of struggle, and he organized the Nazi state that way, so that the German command structure is not set up to cooperate with itself. It is set up as a series of competing structures which are meant to fight each other. And they did this so well that they defeated themselves as well as the Allies defeating them. To ensure that he enjoyed the maximum possible loyalty from his own force, Hitler filled the ranks of the SS with a number of cronies from the early days of the struggle for the cause. At the head of the Waffen-SS was the notorious Heinrich Himmler, a fanatical Nazi with his own warped vision for the creation of a national socialist superstate. The argument he used with Hitler was that this would be a very politically reliable force, that the German army was, after all, average Germans who were averagely indoctrinated, reasonably loyal, but not necessarily very strongly Nazi political animals, whereas Himmler believed he could guarantee that the SS would be a profoundly loyal political force. The man chosen to lead the armed forces of the party, as represented by the Leibstandarte division, was Sepp Dietrich, the old and trusted friend of Adolf Hitler, who had formed the original group. He was to lead the Leibstandarte until 1944, when he was promoted to the position of the commander of the 1st SS Panzer Corps. In common with many of the Nazi hierarchy, Dietrich was a man of little intelligence, but he was to prove himself to be a natural soldier and an inspired commander. Dietrich was an effective leader. He inspired loyalty, he inspired levels of high performance. He was also a good technician and a very good fighting divisional commander. There might be a comparison with Erwin Rommel here, for example. Indeed, both of them, of course, were very loyal Nazis, both of them were promoted very early on under Hitler. The men of the Leibstandarte soon grew to respect their charismatic leader. They knew he was a survivor from rough days of political fistfights, and in the tough world of the SS, that only served to increase his standing. The officers of the regular army had a great deal less respect for Dietrich. Von Rundstedt dismissed Dietrich as decent but stupid. And General Bittrich famously recalled how he spent an hour and a half trying to explain a simple military situation to Sepp Dietrich with the aid of a map. Bittrich came to the conclusion that it was quite useless, as Dietrich was plainly so stupid that he understood nothing at all. Hitler's own description of Dietrich was rather more sinister. Hitler referred to him as cunning, energetic, and brutal. These few short words could almost be used to sum up the career of the Leibstandarte itself. Sepp Dietrich is almost a caricature Nazi figure. He's so dim that despite being a divisional commander and later a Panzer Corps commander, he can't actually do the basic thing and understand the position of his troops on a map. Throughout his career, he had tremendous problem uh, communicating, uh, and especially in writing. And time and time again, uh, soldiers describe him as having a strange charisma, which I suspect comes from the fact he was a very physical man and a very active man. But certainly nobody, not even within the Liebstandarte, has ever claimed that he was anything other than very, very dim. The division was to receive its baptism of fire in the Polish campaign of 1939. The Leibstandarte was attached to von Rundstedt's 10th Army, which was itself part of Army Group South. 
The first battle honor to be won by the Leibstandarte was gained when they stormed the positions of the Polish 10th Infantry Division. The fierce fighting which accompanied that action was repeated as the division fought its way towards Warsaw. Führer was delighted with the performance of his own personal division, but we have no record of his reaction to the news of the first atrocity committed by the men of the Leibstandarte Artillery Company. Right from the outset of this, their first campaign, the military reputation of the SS was to be tarnished by the first report of what was to become a regular series of incidents. This first outrage occurred when some men of the artillery company took part in the massacre of 50 Jews, who were rounded up, taken into a synagogue, then murdered in cold blood. The men of the regular army professed outrage at such unbridled savagery, and von Rundstedt insisted that the men responsible should face a court-martial. However, Heinrich Himmler was able to prevail upon Hitler to prevent the culprits from having to face the uncertain justice of the regular army. Although the men escaped army jurisdiction, the incident served to foster the suspicion which would always exist between them and the SS. It was widely believed, with good reason, that the Leibstandarte enjoyed a privileged position with a direct link to the Führer. And their relationship with the generals who, in theory at least, were in overall command of the division was always an uneasy one. Prior to the invasion of France, the Leibstandarte was again expanded. It was now equipped as a fully motorized infantry regiment, but there were suspicions amongst the ranks of the regular army that the Leibstandarte was receiving favorable treatment when it came to the issue of equipment. They were favored to a considerable degree. They had Himmler, after all, as their boss and their patron, and Himmler after Goering was probably the most important man in the Reich. Hitler trusted Himmler, and Himmler was the man responsible for security. He was a very powerful person. And so when it came to organizing supplies for his forces, he was in a very good position to do so. He would naturally want the very best equipment for his forces and was able to do so. I think it's true to say that the support of Adolf Hitler and Himmler, the Reichsführer SS, meant that the Waffen-SS panzer divisions received preferential treatment in terms of heavy equipment, tanks, artillery, and so forth. And in the last two years of the war, the SS panzer divisions, on an average, tended to be rather better equipped than their army counterparts. Despite the fact that it was a motorized infantry regiment and not a panzer grenadier formation, the Leibstandarte had their own contingent of Panzer IV tanks, and a further detachment of the very latest addition to German weaponry in the form of a section of Sturmgeschutz self-propelled assault guns. This powerful force took part in the invasion of Holland where they encountered only relatively minor resistance from the stunned Dutch defenders, still shocked by the surprise intervention of the German paratroop division. After Holland, the regiment moved southwards to take part in the battle for France, and by the 24th of May, the Leibstandarte had fought its way to the southeastern flank of the beleaguered town of Dunkirk, where the British expeditionary force was trapped by the advancing German army. But it was now that Hitler issued his extraordinary order to halt any further advance against the British forces trapped inside Dunkirk. This decision was taken by Hitler mainly because of the fright given to Rommel's 7th Panzer Division uh, on the 21st of May by a British counterattack at Arras. 
combined with that fact, um, or with that uh, rather frightening episode for the Germans, uh, was the fact that Hitler did not want to waste his panzer divisions in heavy street fighting, which was already beginning to develop around Calais. Uh, and thus, in some ways, the decision was rational uh, to allow the air force to bomb the DEF into submission. Regardless of the dubious wisdom of the order, Hitler was not someone to be disobeyed. And the German army dutifully held its positions, despite the fact that a glittering prize was there for the taking. The delay outside Dunkirk allowed the British expeditionary force to escape back to England. The only exception to the frustrating pause which formed over the battlefield was the Leibstandarte. Sepp Dietrich was not prepared to follow orders which made such little military sense, and as a confidant of Hitler's, he was less fearful of the consequences of disobedience. As a result, the Leibstandarte continued to attack the British expeditionary force and seized the Wadden Heights outside the town in a fiercely contested action which demonstrated just how precarious the real position of the BEF actually was. Once again in the French campaign, we meet our old friend Sepp Dietrich. Uh, he receives a direct order from Hitler not to advance against the British forces. And there can't be that many people, I know that Dietrich was familiar with Hitler and went back a long way with him, there can't be that many people who were prepared deliberately to cross Hitler. Uh, and possibly that's another slight indication uh, of the, um, the fact that Dietrich himself wasn't all that bright. By the time Hitler rescinded his no advance order, the British had managed to escape. Once again, however, their undoubted outstanding military prowess was tarnished by another in the long litany of war crimes, which was to dog the footsteps of the Leibstandarte. This time, it was to be the murder of 80 defenseless British prisoners, many of whom were wounded. This new outrage was committed by the 7th Company of the Leibstandarte 2nd Battalion. The defenseless British prisoners were murdered by hand grenades and machine gun fire, directed into the barn where the men were packed together. The incident was reported after the war by survivors who were left for dead by the Germans. It is to them that we owe our knowledge of this particular crime, but the doubt remains that there may have been others in which no survivors remain to tell the tale. This nagging suspicion hangs like a dark cloud over any discussion of the Leibstandarte in action and overshadows all their later acts of courage, endurance, and military skill. The next demonstration of those military skills by the Leibstandarte came in the short campaign in the Balkans and Greece. The Leibstandarte achieved a remarkable success on only the third day of their campaign when it captured the heavily defended Greek stronghold at Monastir. From there, they moved to capture the Clidi Pass, which was stubbornly defended by Australian and New Zealand troops. Despite the resistance offered by the British forces, the Leibstandarte succeeded in capturing the pass, but at a very high cost, of over 50 dead and 115 wounded. It was here that one of the most famous incidents in the history of the division took place, and it perfectly captured the fighting ethos which the Leibstandarte demanded of its men. Finding his troops pinned down by fierce enemy fire and reluctant to move any further forward, the battalion commander, Kurt Meyer, calmly drew the pin from a hand grenade and tossed the device on the ground behind his own last man. This unusual incentive spurred the section onto the attack and the pass was taken. In later years, Meyer liked to recall how, after the battle, the men laughed heartily at his unorthodox leadership technique. In the face of a stunt like that, it must have been rather nervous laughter. With Greece secure, the Leibstandarte was ready for its greatest trial, the invasion of Russia. It was here that the division was to gain lasting fame and infamy in almost equal measure.
the coming campaign, the Leibstandarte was enlarged to the size of a fully motorized infantry division and attached to Army Group South under Field Marshal von Wunstedt. At the start of the campaign, the Leibstandarte was 11,000 strong, but in due course, it would be upgraded to a full panzer division with its own motorized artillery and tank regiments. As a panzer division, the Leibstandarte's strength rose to around 20,000 men, but the enormous casualty rates which were suffered by an elite division which spent four years at the forefront of Hitler's war meant that some 60,000 men eventually served in the Leibstandarte at some stage. As the war went on, Himmler was able to persuade Hitler to increase the number of SS divisions. In order to achieve the numbers of manpower that Himmler wanted, he was forced to cast the net wider than Germans to provide the soldiers. And so he recruited in France, in Holland, in Norway, Hungary, even sometimes in Poland and elsewhere, recruiting different nationalities into the SS partly under pressure of numbers, but partly justified, too, by his belief that the Aryan race had, after all, been scattered through Europe and that its representatives were not merely to be found in Germany, but that there were blonde-haired people in Norway and in Holland, etc., etc. And so he recruited widely, partly in the belief that he was still getting his Aryans, but also with some kind of cloudy vision that he was creating a new kind of European army. The fact that these were Euro men from European nations, other European nations, joining the German crusade, to some degree persuaded him that the war was a pan-European crusade against Bolshevism and Jews. And so it was very satisfactory for him to achieve this. We should remember too that he did see the SS as an elite. There's no reason why the elite should be restricted solely to Germans. You could get members of the elite elsewhere. And in one speech he even astonishingly referred to ultimately, at some point, recruiting SS members in America. The division was destroyed and rebuilt at least three times during its brief career and there was an almost daily requirement for fresh reinforcements to replace the constant stream of dead and wounded, the casualties of some of the most bitterly contested actions in military history. The war in Russia was unforgiving, harsh, and brutal in the extreme. Despite everything the Germans could throw at them, the Russians stubbornly continued to resist. With two sides who were so ideologically opposed, it was no surprise that the Leibstandarte was again accused of war crimes. Sepp Dietrich had ordered that for a period of three days, all prisoners taken in battle were to be shot in retaliation for the torture and murder of six German soldiers who had been murdered by the Red Army. By this standard of horrendous events in Russia, the shooting of prisoners over a short period was almost a minor incident. The entire German army was responsible for thousands of war crimes and a series of ghastly reprisals against the civilian population. In Russia, brutality and barbarism were not restricted to the men of the SS, and the ordinary German army played its part in the massacre of innocents and was at least in part responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Russian prisoners. The role of the Leibstadt division in Russia was probably twofold. One in fighting against the regular Russian forces where it took part in the 1941 and the 1943 campaigns was involved in very heavy fighting and was decimated ultimately by this experience. It also took part in operations against partisans, against Jews, and against Russians. It took part, in other words, in the murder campaigns that were waged behind the lines to clean out communism, to reduce the number of Russians, to collect and kill Jews. 
It was therefore taking a major role in the ideological war that the Nazis were waging on Russia. For their part, the Russians did not come to the table with clean hands either. And there were thousands of incidents where German soldiers were tortured and murdered by both the Red Army and, more frequently, the partisan forces operating unchecked behind the German lines. In a war in which neither side observed the Geneva Convention, the effect was a descent into barbarism on a scale which can hardly be comprehended. against this terrible backdrop that the Leibstandarte continued to fight its way through the southern part of Russia. They made huge gains of territory, captured thousands of prisoners and destroyed hundreds of tanks. During the bitter fighting which marked the advance into Russia, the Leibstandarte were always at the forefront of the army in a campaign which saw them cover 1,600 kilometers in just over four months. In August 1942, after two years of uninterrupted success, the Leibstandarte finally met its first defeat. It came at the city of Rostov-on-Don. After eight days of bitter street fighting, the inexorable advance of the division was halted at last. The battered survivors were utterly exhausted, and the Leibstandarte was forced onto the defensive. It held out near Rostov-on-Don for that terrible first winter of the war. And in the early summer of 1942, the remnants of the division were ordered to return to France, where between August and the 19th of November 1942, it was re-equipped as a fully-fledged Panzer Grenadier division. This well-earned respite was over all too soon and the Leibstandarte returned to Russia just in time to take part in the terrible fighting of the winter of 1942 to 1943. They were fortunate to have avoided joining the Sixth Army in the disaster at Stalingrad, but they were to gain a measure of revenge by achieving one of the last great victories of the war for Germany. Ironically, it started with another defeat. In the wake of the debacle at Stalingrad, the Russian forces surged on to threaten Kharkov. At this desperate juncture, the newly formed SS Panzer Corps took the field for the first time. Hitler ordered that the corps should be rushed to the Eastern Front with all possible speed. This new corps comprised of three SS divisions, the Leibstandarte Division, the Das Reich Division, and the Totenkopf Division. All three of these elite formations had been reinforced and were lavishly equipped with the very best of the new heavy weapons, including, in the case of the Leibstandarte division, an entire battalion of the formidable Tiger tanks, which were still in desperately short supply. They were also given top priority for movement across the crowded Russian rail network. This was a vital consideration which was necessary to overcome the severe congestion which characterized the overstretched German transport system as it tried to meet the ceaseless demands of the Eastern Front. The forceful contribution of the SS Panzer Corps was felt immediately, as almost from the railhead, a strong attack was mounted on the Russian salient in the Kharkov area. The Leibstandarte division was in action almost as soon as it had formed up for battle. However, even the presence of the SS Panzer Corps was not enough to guarantee the beleaguered city of Kharkov would remain in German hands. Although the initial actions by the SS Panzer Corps had met with success, by the 15th of February 1943, it was obvious that the new SS Panzer Corps was about to be surrounded in Kharkov. Hitler now issued one of his infamous Hold Firm orders. Had the defenders of Kharkov carried out their orders, it is likely that their fate would have mirrored that of the defenders of Stalingrad. The 1st SS Panzer Corps 
were fortunate in their commander, Paul Hauser, who was prepared to disobey Hitler in order to save his corps from certain destruction. Against the express order of the Fuhrer, he withdrew his men from the city, and Kharkov was reoccupied amid great rejoicing by Soviet troops on the 16th of February, 1943. Hitler was incandescent with rage, and he personally flew to the headquarters of Army Group South in order to extract an explanation from Field Marshal von Manstein. The decision to withdraw the Liebstandarte and the other SS units from Kharkov uh, must rank as one of the, the more courageous decisions. The commander, uh, Paul Hauser, was absolutely correct that to leave the army encircled in Kharkov would have led to their destruction. Again, he was one of the few commanders who was prepared to defy Hitler. And despite the fact that Hitler himself flew into a rage and personally got in an aircraft to go and see von Manstein, Hauser, without doubt, did the right thing by his men. The reputation of his own personal favorite formation had been tarnished. And during a long, furious rant, Hitler demanded the immediate recapture of Kharkov. It was now a matter of honor. The city had to be retaken in order to restore the reputation of the SS. Despite the prevailing operational situation, which was rapidly moving against the increasingly hard-pressed German forces, the 1st SS Panzer Corps was able to execute an audacious counter-offensive, involving a three-pronged offensive by each of the divisions in the Corps, which saw Kharkov firmly back in German hands by March the 16th. 1943. The fighting which led to the capture of Kharkov saw some of the most bitterly contested actions which the Leibstandarte was to encounter in a career marked by extraordinarily bitter and vicious fighting. With the Soviet troops still elated from their capture of the city, it proved to be a difficult task to drive the determined defenders from the ready-made defensive positions amidst the rubble of the city which had now changed hands twice in the space of as many months. The fierce battles which took place, often at suicidally short ranges, re-established the reputation of the SS Panzer Corps in their Fuhrer's eyes. The recapture of Kharkov was to prove to be the last real success for the German army on the Eastern Front. At the same time, the SS Panzer Corps had proved beyond doubt that it was a capable and potent battlefield formation. But the success of Kharkov also served to create a dangerous precedent. Hitler now became convinced that his Waffen-SS formations were capable of achieving almost any task assigned to them. In the coming months and years, these already difficult tasks would become increasingly impossible. As the thinly stretched resources were called upon to rescue situations which would have been beyond the ability of far larger formations, in the coming months and years, the SS Panzer Corps would continue to fight with bravery, but the road ahead now lay only downwards into defeat. After the Battle of Kharkov, there was a rare lull in the fighting, and the German forces in Russia gathered their strength for the battle which even Hitler knew would be his last chance to win the war in Russia. This was Operation Citadel, one of the biggest battles of the entire war. Fighting under General Hoth, the Leibstandarte managed to drive some 25 kilometers into the Soviet defenses in the southern sector of the Kursk salient, and extra Russian reinforcements had to be hurriedly thrown into position. It was this sector of the front that saw the great tank battle of Prokhorovka, a gigantic clash of Russian and German armor which involved a huge swirling melee as the Tigers and Panthers clashed with the T-34s. Prokhorovka, like many of the actions in Operation Citadel, proved bloody but indecisive. The sides were so finely balanced that neither could gain the decisive edge at the tactical level on the battlefield but strategically, the losses suffered by the Leibstandarte could never be made good. And every German tank destroyed brought the Russians closer to victory. 
the inability to achieve the decisive breakthrough and encircle the Russian forces was tantamount to a defeat for the Germans. The tenacity of the Russian resistance finally won the day, and Hitler was forced to abandon the Battle of Kursk on the 22nd of July. In the wake of the failure of Operation Citadel, the Leibstandarte was withdrawn for a well-earned rest and refit in Italy. Even in the relative civilization of Italy, there was a series of war crimes involving Hans Piper, who was accused of causing the unnecessary deaths of civilians. Other members of the Leibstandarte were accused of the murder of local Jews. But the ominous presence of the Russian front was never far from German minds. In the autumn of 1943, the situation had begun to deteriorate on an almost daily basis, and the division was urgently embarked on trains and dispatched to Russia for the beginning of what was to be its third winter of that terrible war. By this stage, the German army in Russia was in such disarray that the Leibstandarte had to fight its way out of the railway station. There was even worse to come. The weakened division was encircled by superior Russian forces and trapped in a pocket together with two other panzer divisions. It was symbolic of just how far the star of the premier fighting formation of the Third Reich had fallen, that the division had to be rescued by two of the new panzer divisions created to bolster the crumbling front lines. In the wake of this new setback, the Leibstandarte was again recalled to France to be brought back up to strength. It proved to be a timely move, because in June 1944, they were in the right place to be pitched against the might of the Allies in the Battle for Normandy. Despite the massive disparity in the relative strength between the two sides, the Leibstandarte, now fighting as part of the 1st SS Panzer Corps, under the direction of their old commander, Sepp Dietrich, performed with almost superhuman courage to resist the Allied invasion. At that time, the British and Americans enjoyed complete air superiority and the ability to call down massive naval artillery barrages, which were so powerful they could flip a 50-ton Tiger tank onto its back like a child's toy. Despite the many disadvantages, Michael Wittmann, in particular, won lasting fame by his incredible victories over numerically superior British tanks in the Battle of villers bocage But time was now running out for Germany, and the Battle for Normandy was lost in the cauldron at Falaise, where 60,000 German troops were surrounded and pounded into submission by the Allied air forces. Almost all of the remaining tanks in the Leibstandarte were destroyed in the action at Falaise. Once again, the division was rebuilt from the shattered remnants which survived from Normandy, but incredibly, Hitler chose to go over to the offensive. With the launch of the ill-fated Ardennes offensive, the men of the Leibstandarte once more rolled forward to the attack. The situation was now very different from the glory days of 1940. Devastated at home by Allied bombing raids and terrorized at the front by Allied fighter bombers, the forces assembled for the Ardennes offensive were so short of fuel that they had to rely on the slim prospect of capturing Allied fuel stocks. This simply did not happen, and despite some early successes, the offensive ground to a halt as the tanks ran out of fuel. The air filled with Allied fighter bombers, and the tank crews were forced to blow up the surviving vehicles and escape on foot as best they could. By any sensible reckoning, the war should now have been over for the men of the Leibstandarte. They had fought well in some of the most bitterly contested battles of the war, but Hitler had one last job. They were hurriedly reinforced and sent to take part in Operation Spring Awakening, 
a forlorn attempt to prevent the Red Army from capturing Budapest in March 1945. But it was here that the Leibstandarte took part in its last offensive. But once more they were unable to stem the Red Tide, now moving inexorably against Germany. Faced with the prospect of certain destruction, the division began to withdraw. This sent Hitler into a towering rage. In a fit of pique, he ordered that the Leibstandarte should remove the armbands which bore his name. Outraged by this ingratitude, the senior officers of the Leibstandarte are said to have sent all of their own medals and decorations back to Hitler in a chamber pot with the message, that's all the thanks we get. The story may be apocryphal, but it certainly summed up the declining spirit of the forces still fighting in the closing days of the war. The division retreated into Austria, and with the war lost, they surrendered to the Americans. But a single battalion, chosen from the ranks of the Leibstandarte as Hitler's personal bodyguard, died, defending the bunker in Berlin. After the war, the entire SS was outlawed as a criminal organization, and with the dubious service records of many of its members, that should come as no surprise. Although many faced trial after the war, most of the perpetrators of the crimes committed during their course of the war were able to escape the death penalty, which they could have expected in retribution for their role in the fierce outrages they had committed. The German civil courts proved to be predictably sympathetic and many death sentences imposed by court-martials were commuted to life in prison, which, after a decent interval, were in turn quietly reduced to a term of a few years. Those unfortunate enough to fall into the hands of the Russians experienced much harsher treatment. Many were held in captivity for 10 years after the war. A surprisingly high number of senior figures in the story of the Leibstandarte survived the war. Michael Wittmann was killed in Normandy, but the release of Hans Joachim Piper in 1955 was celebrated by Kurt Meyer, Piper himself, Max Wunsch, and that former friend of Adolf Hitler, Sepp Dietrich, founder and leader of the Leibstandarte.